Hey everyone, I'm Michael and I'm going to be talking to you today about asynchronous programming in Emacs Lisp. I'm located in the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm a developer as well as a longtime Emacs user. You may have heard of async or asynchronous programming. The idea has been around for decades but it first gained widespread attention in JavaScript back in the aughts. Then in the teens, it gained tremendous popularity in the DevOps world with Golang. And just in the last few years, support for async programming has landed in Rust. Well, it can be done in Emacs as well. And this talk will demonstrate that by walking you through a little problem that I actually solved for myself. Like a lot of these stories, it begins with scratching a personal itch. Um, in my case, automating my music server. Uh, I use something called the Music Player Daemon locally, and as the name suggests, it just kind of hangs out in the background, reads music files, and talks to assorted sound drivers. In fact, it is so focused on that mission that it doesn't even offer a user interface. Instead, it serves an API and invites application developers to build clients on top of that API. Okay, so let's hop into a vterm, and I'd like to show you the MPD client I use for my daily driver, uh, something called NCMP CPP. Doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but I've got a playlist. Uh, I can browse the file system. Looks like I can search my music library, yada, yada, yada. It's got all the basic features. The point that I want to make is that NCMP CPP is a completely independent project of MPD, separate and distinct. It does all of its work by simply communicating with the music player daemon over the API. Well, I wanted to program to that API only from within Emacs. Now, there are already Emacs MPD clients out there, but I didn't really want a full-blown client. I just wanted a few small tweaks over my current configuration. Um, a command to skip to the next song, uh, maybe shove the current track into the mode line, things like this. I needed an ELISP API that would let me do this. Okay, well, let's get out of NCMP CPP and let's get into a netcat session with my local MPD server. Um, as you can see, we get a welcome string, uh, so it is a server goes first protocol. But after that, it's a very familiar text-based request response oriented protocol. I can ask for the volume. I can ask for the status. But in particular, I wanted an asynchronous API. If I issue a command like find every track in my library that's going to produce a lot of data that's a human perceptible pause as Emacs processes all the input. What I wanted was a style of programming where I could fire off my command, have the Emacs command loop keep working, and only invoke some callback when there was data available. Well, Emacs is famously single-threaded, so it shouldn't come as a surprise that it offers a rich set of primitives that enable the sort of network programming that I wanted to do. In particular, it offers a function called make network process. Now this method offers a bewildering variety of options, but at the heart of the matter, it opens a network connection to some endpoint out there, and we can configure it to be uh, non-blocking. It returns a handle that you can use to refer to this network connection with other methods. Other methods such as process and string, which as the name suggests, allows you to send textual data to the remote endpoint of your network connection. You can also use it with set process filter, which allows you to associate a callback with your network connection. That callback will be invoked when there is data available in the process's read buffer. In other words, in a request response oriented protocol like that of MPD, you open your socket with make network, make network process, send your request via process send string, and life will just continue in Emacs until some data shows up in the process's read buffer, at which point your 
uh, callback will be invoked. Um, it turns out this was enough for a purpose-built async runtime. Uh, let's work through the sequence of events when opening a connection and firing off a few commands in this style. Okay, so let's imagine a library that offers a connection object of some sort, a caller, and an MPD server out on the network. The caller will presumably get themselves a connection object by invoking some sort of connect method on our library. We can handle this through make network process, but we're going to invoke make network process with no weight equal to true, in other words, asynchronously. That means the method is going to return immediately. We won't even know if the connection is up, let alone what the response would be. This has some implications. At this point, we've returned control to the caller. The Emacs uh, event loop is proceeding quite happily. And so the caller is free to start using our connection object. They might say, issue a status command. Okay, well, in our library, we, we don't have our connection yet. How on earth are we going to service this? Well, we can simply give ourselves a queue and note down the fact that we owe a status command. That's pretty quick. We've now returned control back to our caller and they are again free to issue more commands. Maybe they issue a play command. Okay, well, we're gonna go deeper into debt and note that we also owe a play command. At some point in the indeterminate future, MPDU is, well, the connection will get up, MPD will allocate resources uh, to track a new client, they will write the welcome string into the socket, and those bytes are gonna show up in the Emacs process read buffer, at which point our callback will be invoked. Um, we can parse the, ver the welcome string, maybe note the version that a connection object that might come in handy, but the key point is our callback needs to take a look at the queue and notice, oh, we owe a status command. And so we'll invoke process send string and send the status command down the pipe. Again, at some indeterminate time in the future, some bytes are gonna show up in our process's read buffer and our callback will again be invoked. Um, we've got the volume is 75 plus a lot of other stuff and, and, and here we come to the next problem. If our caller invoked status, they probably wanted to know about the status. So how shall we get them to them? Well, uh, there's really not a lot of options at this point except the callback. Okay, so change of plan. Uh, our queue is no longer a queue of commands. It's going to be a queue of commands with associated callbacks. We read the response off the socket invoke our caller supplied callback, and then pop the, the queue. Uh, at this point, our callback, the library callback, needs to note that we still have a pending command. We fire that off down the pipe. At some indeterminate time in the future, we get a, call, we get a response. Uh, our callback is invoked. We invoke the caller supplied callback, and we pop the queue. Um, the structure of such a program is best viewed as a finite state machine, and this is typically where you end up in asynchronous programming, at least when you don't have a runtime grafted onto your program the way you do with Golang, or when you don't have sort of extensive library support the way you do with Rust. Uh, your data structure exists in one of these states at any given time, and when input shows up on your file descriptor, you transition along one of these edges to a new state. Cool, so let's take a look at some of the code that flows from this. Okay, let's hop over to an Emacs and take a look at how we might code this up. If you recall the sequence diagrams I shared, we're gonna be scribbling down the command and the callback that we'll be invoking upon its completion. So the first thing I did was give myself a little command struct. Uh, with that, I was able to define the connection object. Uh, we're going to be storing the handle to the connection. Uh, we're going to write down the protocol version that we harvest 
from the welcome message. And of course, we'll be recording the command queue as well. And so I gave myself a little connection object, uh, with, uh, connection struct with those three attributes. With the data model squared away, uh, it was really pretty easy to code up the connect implementation. I'm leaving some details for uh, exposition purposes, but in the event, it's really not that uh, more complex than what you see here. Uh, we're gonna unpack the arguments, figure out where the MPD server is to which you would like us to connect. We'll connect via make network process. We'll associate a library to find callback with that uh, connection via set process filter. Then we'll instantiate the connection object and return it to the caller. Once the caller has a connection object, they're free to send commands down that connection. So what we're doing here is simply instantiating a command object on the basis of the caller supplied arguments and appending it to the queue. And then the last thing we do, and I've just indicated this with a comment, is we kick the queue. This kind of goes back to the state transition diagram I laid out earlier. Uh, what this means is the, the logic for saying, well, if we're awaiting the completion of a previously sent command, there's really not much more to be done. We're just going to uh, uh, push this command onto the queue and return. On the other hand, if the queue is empty uh, on entry to LMPD send, there's no reason not to just immediately send the command. And this is an example of the sort of client-side code that results from this API. So you can see here, we are giving ourselves a connection to the MPD server on the local host, and we're gonna send the get volume command uh, down that connection. And if that command completes and all is well, we'll just uh, send a message to Emacs. Unfortunately, you can't see my mini buffer, so I'll hop over to the messages buffer. And there's our result. The volume is 43. Great, uh, I thought. Um, simple, clean, responsive, easy to code to. That is unfortunately not the end of the story. Let, let's continue this example a little bit. Uh, let's imagine that if the volume comes back from the server and it is less than 50, we would like to set it to 50. So this is interesting because we have two commands and whether or not we send the second command is going to depend on the response we get from the first. Okay, I thought, well, that's fine. I can simply put that logic in the callback that I specify to, for the get volume command. So here we are, we check the return code, we parse the volume, we compare it to 50, and if it's less, we just invoke LMPD send again from the first command's callback. Okay, uh, I could live with that. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen. Let's extend this example a little further. And this is contrived, but, but bear with me. Let us suppose that if we do set the volume to 50, we'd like to get the volume one more time just to make sure that our change took on the server. Okay, uh, we can play the same game. Uh, we will put that logic in the callback that we specified for the set volume command. And here we are, uh, we check the return code, we send a message to Emacs, we send uh, the get volume command again, along with its own callback. And at this point, I think, you know, I hope it's clear the problem that is emerging. Um, and if it's not yet, let us uh, let me note that so far we're only handling the happy path in each of these callbacks. We really ought to do something about the error path. Um, for purposes of illustration, let's just say we, we send a message to Emacs. That means it would look like this. And it's at this point that I really think it's impossible to deny that this API is actually not that easy to program to. And if there are any JavaScript devs uh, watching, you're probably chuckling right now because I have discovered for myself what they call callback hell. Um, if you are returning the results of asynchronous function invocations to their caller via callbacks, you pretty much inevitably end up in this sort of deeply nested sequence of callbacks that is difficult to write, difficult to read, and difficult to reason about. And yet, when I was stuck in this situation, it just seemed like it really shouldn't be this bad. 
Uh, if I give myself this sort of tabular data structure, I felt that this expressed precisely the same logic, just in a much easier to read manner. I could, in my mind's eye, see the code for transforming this data structure, which is really just a list, into uh, the code that you just saw in, in the previous slide. And really, if Lisp is good at anything, it is list processing, right? And it was really at this point that a little bit of enlightenment dawned. I learned that Lisp is homoiconic, which is just means that the language itself is a data structure in that language. Uh, Lisp code is, after all, just a list. And the power of Lisp macros is taking that data structure, some data structure that you've defined, and doing exactly what I wanted to do, transforming it from one list into another, the destination list being Lisp code. So I got busy and I coded up my first Lisp macro, which I called LMPD chain. And that lengthy list of, you know, three or four nested callbacks gets turned into this, which I, I hope you'll agree is uh, much simpler, much easier to read, much easier to reason about. Uh, and if you're morbidly curious, you can, you can expand your macros um, and this invocation of LMBD chain expands to this. So that's my story. Um, in all fairness, I should note that the MPD protocol has some subtleties and complexities that I didn't really get into, uh, both due to time constraints and because they're not terribly relevant to the points I wanted to touch on. Uh, I should also note that there's a fair amount of work in the library itself around accumulating partial responses as they show up uh, in the buffer and dispatching them piecemeal to the caller uh, that was really too complex to, to get into here. Uh, if you would like to see the code, it's available on GitHub as well as Melpa. Um, I'll be putting a, a version of this talk on my personal site and you can always reach out to me. Uh, personally, I hang out uh, on AR IRC as Spiff or you can just email me as uh, spiff at pobox.com. Thank you very much. Mm.